When you hear the word techie, what comes to mind? What do you see? For many, it's probably someone like this. He was probably exposed to technology at an early age, either through his parents or early education. He probably went to Stanford. He's probably now working at Facebook or Google or Uber or Airbnb, or maybe he's a startup CEO. And according to this Google search, he's probably white, male, and somewhere between 20 and 40. The story of this techie is celebrated over and over and over. You see him in the press, you see him winning awards, you see him raising venture capital. But there's another story in tech that's not being told. It's of another kind of techie. They don't come from privilege, they didn't go to Ivy League schools, maybe they came from poverty or rough homes. They probably didn't have access to technology in early childhood, but when they discovered it, they worked against all odds to get to Silicon Valley. They overcame unimaginable obstacles and made careers for themselves, despite people telling them they couldn't. And now they're also working at Google and Facebook and Uber and Airbnb and running companies and building the products you love. But you don't really hear about them. Their stories are not usually heard or celebrated. They also happen to be hired less, paid less, promoted less, and funded less than that first kind of techie. They experience bias, discrimination, harassment, based on their gender, age, race, or sexuality, or simply not being a culture fit for the valley. So how did I know these techies even existed? I know because I was one. I've lived in San Francisco for seven years and worked in tech for four of them before eventually getting fed up and leaving the industry. Since then, I've built a career as an editorial, commercial, and portrait photographer, with the majority of my work being focused on Silicon Valley. As someone who worked in tech, I never felt like I fit in. I grew up in a small town in North Carolina where most people never leave. I barely graduated from a public state university. I didn't know Silicon Valley existed until I was 20. I moved to San Francisco with 40 bucks, no financial safety net, no personal network, and I landed my first startup job through a stranger at a coffee shop. I spent most of my time in tech feeling isolated, wondering if there were anyone else like me, people who didn't come from top-tier schools, people who didn't have families or networks to fall back on, people who made it to California with a card stacked against them. Little did I know they were also out there, also feeling isolated, and years later they would become the focus of my work. Fast forward to today. Tech is in a weird place right now. In 2016, the word techie is not being met with the same admiration it once had. The term has become loaded, even derogatory. It's a word that's become synonymous with privilege and greed. Within the industry, conversations around diversity and inclusion have risen to a boil. At the same time, many in the industry view these issues with skepticism or dismiss them altogether. They believe tech is a meritocracy, and if you can't figure out how to benefit from it, that's a fault of your own. So a few months ago, I set out to do a project exploring all of this. In the first three months of 2016, I set out to, to collect the stories of 100 people in the tech industry. I focused on folks whose stories are less told, those of women, people of color, LGBT, over 50, disabled, and so on. I wanted to learn more about where they come from, the obstacles they overcame to get here, the hardships they continue to face day to day in the industry, and why they choose to stay. I put a call for subjects out on Medium, and over 500 people applied in two weeks. Three months and over 1,000 hours of work later, the result was the Techies Project. Of the 100 people I interviewed and photographed, 70 were women and 59 were people of color. 25 were LGBT, 23 were immigrants, and 18 grew up in poverty. Most of these folks have never been in the press, and many were sharing their experiences with me for the first time ever. I met folks like Nancy Duyan. She was raised in an immigrant community, actually of illegal immigrants, and eventually put in foster care. She was brilliant, but depressed and failing out of school. She discovered tech as a teenager when strangers noticed her potential and introduced her to the computer clubhouse at MIT. I didn't want to do computer science. I didn't think I could write. I grew up in the hood. I didn't, I didn't have good grades. I had the third lowest GPA in high school. I had just pure depression. It wasn't because I was smart. 
right? And here these people at MIT are saying, Nancy, you got this. You got to like come to MIT. Come to MIT. I can't get to MIT, right? Let alone code, because I mean these folks are making it sound like it's like a man's job. She now travels the world doing UX for Google. Everett Kadigbach who grew up surrounded by gangs and crime, and at 21 had a child, a music degree, and no plans of being in tech. But eight years ago, even though everyone he knew discouraged him, he took a chance on an opportunity to build out the brand of a little tech company called Facebook. At Facebook, like, I had no idea what I was doing. Um, I knew that I'd be focusing on communication design and more of the, the brand aspects of it, but I don't even think we knew what that was at Facebook, and, and again, it was like, still early in my career so like I didn't have any kind of formulated opinions on it so it's kind of like this perfect storm of like just go with your gut and see what happens. February Keeney, the engineering manager for the community and safety team at GitHub who spent her first decade in tech presenting as male and when she transitioned became aware of the privilege she lost. I mean when I was trying to figure things out and just sort of living in sort of genderqueer life mm -hmm. and I needed to find a different job and sort of being determined, like, I don't want to go any place that won't accept me as I am. Mm -hmm. And so presenting very genderqueer in interviews and not getting any offers. Mm -hmm. And then finally, one day, just being like, fine. No nail polish, no lip gloss, button tie on shirt, tie, just present as male as possible. And lo and behold, that, I got an offer. Quite literally, every time I've been brought in for an on-site interview, my entire career, and presented male, I've got an offer. And Michelle Morrison, who grew up on welfare and never earned a college degree, who hustled her way from Lori's Diner to Apple, spent five years growing Square from tiny startup to, I, to IPO, and now builds software for those in poverty at IDO.org. I think as a young woman in America, I have had life-changing opportunities because of tech. I went from being on welfare as a kid that level of citizenship to building technologies that are used globally for anyone who wants to like engage in commerce and like it's changed my worldview. It's changed my skill set. I can code, I can write copy, I can design <laughs> interfaces, I can launch international campaigns, I can I can do so much now for the world that I couldn't do before. So I've learned a lot. And it's allowed me to really focus on what I value, for better or for worse. And my priorities now are enabling other women and spending money and time and energy on things that I care about. Poor people just don't have that luxury. I encourage all of you to take a look at techiesproject.com, where you can find all 100 interviews. I had many goals for this project, from changing people's perceptions of what a techie is to helping underrepresented people in the industry feel less alone. But if you can take one thing away from my presentation today, I would love for it to be this. I'm going to ask you to get uncomfortable, to consider the idea that tech is not the meritocracy that you think it is. And despite the obvious talent and intelligence you all possess in this room, perhaps there are greater systems at work that helped you get to where you are and that these same systems hold back people who aren't like you. That there are extraordinary people working in Silicon Valley, many at companies you created, contributing to the cognitive diversity of your teams and enabling you to build products for global audiences who are being underestimated or ignored based on assumptions about their potential. That these people are putting up with it for now because they love technology, they're activated by the work they do, and they want to see the industry get better. But after a few years, if nothing changes, they will likely get fed up and leave the industry, as I did three years ago and as many others have done after me. If this continues to happen, the industry will never reach its full potential. I want to leave you with a quote from my project by Victor Roman. How can we measure someone's accomplishments without recognizing that not everyone starts in the same place at the, you know, on the racetrack? Some people start a mile or two back. And then when they don't finish in first place, we ask, well, you didn't do very good. When the reality is they ran faster and they ran longer than any of those other people, the person who ran first place, they just started at a different location, you know? And 
I think that's an important part of this conversation, you know, about what is that mile or two back? What makes up that distance? Thank you.